successful year. So what, what I've been doing um, this, uh, during this session is, as I learned yesterday, is called doing a Carla. And, uh, um, but, but now, which means for those who weren't here yesterday, which means sitting still and listening. But now I'm going to play some of it back to you. So I think we all agree that Wafa has given us a really um, very comprehensive and useful overview of the relevant clinical studies that are important in this context. And she concluded that modeling and observational studies support the notion that TASP will be working. But she also, I think between the lines at least, um, made it very clear that we need more evidence. And of course, uh, randomized trials are now on the way. She mentioned a study from China which didn't fit the discordant couple studies. And let me just make one comment on this study. I've actually looked at it in the context of a Cochrane collaboration review. It's not a good study. Um, there is no data on person time, but we do know that the treated group was uh, followed up longer than the non-treated group. So I think there may be some uh, methodological reasons why this is an outlier. She then discussed the benefits and risks of early therapy, which have been hotly discussed at other uh, meetings previously. And we do have this discrepancy between NA Accord and now two other analyses. It has to be said, though, they, they, they're the same people. Um, and I, I wondered what people actually believe now based on these uh, three observational studies using very sophisticated statistical methods. And I, I, I thought I might take a vote here and ask, do you believe that starting above 500 re reduces mortality, as I understand was shown in one of the studies, but not in the other two? So who believes starting very early is associated with a reduction in mortality. Please show your hands. Mortality. Mortality. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to see. <laughs> so. Ah. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will ask that right now. Who does? Okay, I, I think the question would be, do you believe it makes no difference? Do you, do you believe that the evidence isn't there? No, that's not the question. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to swiftly move on and summarize again the important challenges, and this is obviously one of them, which uh, Wafa listed in, in, in her presentation, and she produced some really interesting and very important data on the cascade, and one uh, impressive uh, uh, piece, uh, I think, from Mozambique, where 7,000 patients were diagnosed with HIV and a bit above 300 ended up uh, on sustained ART at, th at, at six months. And I think retention in care is perhaps one of the issues that um, wasn't covered uh, as extensively. And I felt I might add some data, um, some data which is uh, due to be published uh, soon from the idea collaboration from Southern Africa, where almost 100,000 patients who, are, um, who were starting ART in the Republic of South Africa and in Zambia and Malawi were followed up. And we used a so-called multi-state modeling approach, which takes into account the competing risk of different outcomes. So when you lost to follow up, you, um, or when, you, when you're dead, you can't become lost to follow up anymore. So you need, you need to take these competing risks into account, that, which is something not, that is not always done and, and can produce quite misleading results. So we looked at death, loss to follow up, and switching to second line ART. And the results are on this slide. So you see the um, four um, treatment sites in South Africa on the top, and the two um, treatment sites in Malawi and Zambia and the difference, of course, is that in South Africa we have viral load monitoring, whereas in Malawi and Zambia we don't. And now you see over time, and you see we start at six months, so we only include people who remained in care 
um, up to six months. So it's, it's sort of the follow-up from the data that you showed for Mozambique. And you see that in South Africa, after at, or at three years, about 20% are no longer in care. All these people here in white, the white area, is the people who are on a first-line regimen. And then you see that uh, a proportion of people in, in, hatched, in the hatched area is on a failing first-line regimen, virologic failure in South Africa, because they do have viral load monitoring. And then this is the, um, the number of people who have been switched to a second-line regimen, and in blue, is the number of people who, or patients who have been lost to follow up, and in red, the number of deaths. And this looks quite different, as you see in Malawi and Zambia, where we have more deaths, and especially more loss to follow up, in blue, and disconcertingly, many more patients who remain on a failing, and this is now immunological failure, because they do not have viral load monitoring, who remain on a immunologically failing regimen. And talking to clinicians in Zambia and Malawi, they often say, we don't switch patients because we don't really know what's going on, we don't have viral load, we'd like to do a viral load test, etc. And we therefore also wondered whether switching in settings where there's no viral load available is actually a good idea, because the clinicians are reluctant. And we did some causal modeling. So this is the type of approach that Miguel Hernan um, has been uh, popularizing uh, in recent years, where you basically turn your observational study into an RCT. You mimic an RCT by a weighting procedure. And what you see is that, yes, switching people to second line in programs that do not have access to viral load monitoring is beneficial in the causal model. You see the effect gets stronger as you go from crude to a standard adjusted model to a causal model, it reduces the risk of death, this is mortality, by three quarters. And you also see that there's, this is now a time-dependent model where you look at early versus later switching, and again, earlier switching is associated with a um, survival benefit. So the last slide... Um, which sort of summarizes uh, Wafa's talk and some of the discussion is that there's no magic bullet. It will be a multi-component strategy. We need to think about how best to expand testing, and there were some interesting examples uh, in, in the discussion. Linkage to care is an issue not only for ART, but as was mentioned, for PrEP, for uh, male circumcision. We need to make sure that people get started on ART. We need to make sure they stay on ART, they adhere to it, and are not lost to follow up. And of course, positive prevention in discordant couples is important. Now, me coming from Switzerland, which is a country where measles vaccination is a real problem, we have a coverage below 80% uh, with measles vaccination, and we're now getting more and more measles uh, outbreaks and, um, and epidemics. Um, I think this tension between the benefit between individual and society and public health ethics is a really important um, issue in this context and an issue that we need to address quite aggressively if we really want to get coverage up in the context of treatment and prevention. Thank you very much.